Hello and welcome to a very special How I Paint Things. Now today I'm going to do both a review and a painting guide for the War Games Atlantic Plastic French Infantry. So if you want to skip ahead straight to the painting, make sure to check out the timestamps below. They will let you skip over the review if you've already got these guys or if you're just not that interested. Now the kit themselves does actually give you a bunch of options. It's not too bad on the whole. It's gonna sound like I'm grizzling about it quite a bit, but I promise I'm really just highlighting the stuff that isn't perfect because honestly, for the most part, it's, it's an all right kit. So all of the paints for this will be listed in the description. And as I mentioned, you can skip ahead to the painting straight away, but one way or the other, let's get started. So we'll get us start by looking at the box itself. And that's probably a little unusual, but there are some nice touches to it, which I think are worth highlighting. Of course, it is designed primarily for the Great War, so that's what we've got on the cover there. Nice sky blue uniforms, and it's actually some really interesting uh, color inspiration. So if you're not 100% certain on how you'd want to paint these guys, well, there's a pretty good answer. On the back as well, it does also have uh, some examples from World War II. There are a couple of little things that I will change when I paint mine, so we'll bear that in mind. Uh, but otherwise, it's it's pretty cool. There's plenty there. It tells you about everything you've got. Brilliant. Now it says on the front, 35 multi-part hard plastic figures, and that is technically correct. You're going to have five sprues in there, and on each of those frames, there are six bodies. But, and there's kind of always a but with everything I'm going to tell you with this kit, five of those figures are this officer. So you've actually got... 30 basic infantry and then five officers. Now I can't conceive of a game system that requires you to have five officers on the table at a platoon level. I really think that it would have been better served by just having a sixth infantryman and you can source an officer from somewhere. It is a nice touch though and the parts available for the officer are actually pretty cool so I'm not going to grizzle too long about that but 35 infantry would really have been nice. Now the sprues themselves are actually loaded with stuff. Uh, you can't complain about the amount that you're actually getting in the box for he these guys. Uh, you've got rifles for all of them. There's two shasha uh, heads. There are so many heads. There's Cappy heads, there's Adrian helmets, and there's actually six uh, helmets with dudes who look like the Harlem Hellfighters. So if you're looking to put either like uh, French colonial troops or you know black Americans on the table, these heads will actually do the job. That's pretty cool. Uh, like I said, tons of variety, uh, including two pistols, which is a nice touch because especially if you're playing bolt action, you're probably not going to want to put a rifle or a submachine gun on your machine gun loaders. So being able to give them that pistol is quite a nice touch. Now these being designed predominantly for World War I, there are going to be one or two anachronisms if you were to just apply all of this and paint them in modern green or brown, whatever you, whatever you want to call it, and put them on the table. But one of the nice things on the kit is this sprue here. So you've got here heads with the uh, Senegalese fellas with these awesome sort of fez arrangements along with the blades. You've also got more modern rifles, submachine guns, and a really nice touch is these carbines. If you wanted to make dragoons, you could very easily use the carbines and paint these fellas with blue trousers, and that would work just fine. They've also got the more modern packs, and yeah, that's a really neat inclusion. I've seen photographs of fellas who are marching off in 1939 who are still wearing the old uh, wooden framed backpacks. So even if you do want to mix things up a little, you've got plenty of options to do so. The fellas you'll build out of this kit will still be carrying and wearing slightly older gear, but for France in 1939, that's perfect. But I did mention there are one or two things which kind of bugged me about the kit, and one of them is the fact that they are sort of limited by the design. Uh, plastic injection molding requires certain ways of doing things, and you'll see it in the back of these great coats. Uh, they are very close against the back of the legs, even on the fellas that are supposed to be sprinting. Uh, this could be solved by casting them in two parts and having essentially legs and uh, upper body with a separate greatcoat section. 
but they haven't gone that route and just a couple of them do look a little weird. Like particularly from the front, this fella looks like he's got something really pushing down on the back of his coat in a place where it wouldn't. So the sculpting on them isn't terrible, it's just there are one or two odd looking poses amongst this as a result. Like I said, you're not going to need five officers. Um, it, it's cool that he's there, but uh, give me another one of these dudes. Then finally, my last real bugbear with this kit. I've clipped one of these fellas off really quickly to show you. And there it is, these peg neck arrangements. A couple of kits recently have started doing this. Uh, the, the Death Corps from Citadel, they're a good example. I hate this. This is a design thing which ought to be a crime because the heads fit on these. They sit on top with a flat neck, which means if I want to pivot the head in any way, I can only turn on that one plane. If I want to change the angle of the head position, I have to get in there and either trim this or add a little bit of green stuff or something like that, when this could just as easily have been a socket and the neck be a ball joint. That's it. I detest these. And I know it's not going to be a big deal to some folks. It's probably going to seem like I'm just being fussy, but I am going to be fussy. You have so many extra heads in this kit. It is criminal that these are not going to fit on something like Warlord figures or Anvil or even Games Workshop kits because they're about the same size. So what I've got is this, ah, the, the poses are locked unless I want to go and change everything. And some of you are going to say that's the benefit of plastic. Eh, I really just prefer if they had made this a ball and socket joint. It would have been simple and it would have solved my last real grizzle about this kit. Now once they're all assembled, they're actually not too bad. Uh, the arm joints take a little bit of work to, to get your flow when you're building them, but they aren't a deal breaker at all. They're pretty simple to assemble. There's only so many parts, you can't mess it up. And the frames are labeled. So you have uh, R1, L1 for the arms and so forth. You can't mess that up as long as you're paying attention. These fellas though, at the moment, are the only plastic French infantry in 156 scale that I have come across. And they aren't bad. It's really just a case of, oh yeah, plastic infantry, I guess. So, well, there's not really a lot which makes them bad. Like they aren't a bad box. They're just not massively inspiring and they could have been that little bit better. All the same, they're pretty reasonably priced. And if you are looking to bulk out a French army or to start a new one, you can't really go wrong with these guys. I'd say despite my grizzling, they're a pretty decent box. Anyhow, let's pick one of these guys and we'll go ahead and get started painting. Now to prime this fella, I've used Vallejo's primer spray of English uniform. And the irony of that is not lost on me. But it's got a nice tiny greenish tint to it, which is going to work quite well for the main uniform color. That color is green-brown. And that's another Vallejo color. Most of this is going to be Vallejo. I'm going to apply this with just a tiny wee bit of water in it and a big old brush. We are not fussed about how this goes on. All you want to do is give this a quick coat over all of the uniform. Now you can use any light or sort of medium brown primer you like here, but I tend to find that English uniform will be a little forgiving. If you miss any areas with this base color, it's all right, it's just gonna look like it's shaded. Now green brown is a funny old color because in some lights it's gonna look green and in some it's gonna look brown. Particularly on flat areas like the sleeve and the back of his coat here, you are definitely going to want that second coat to make sure you've got a nice solid color. And remember, for your basic infantryman, his trousers and his uh, putties would all have been the same color. If you do decide you want to paint these guys up as chasseurs, you can paint a dark blue on those both now. Up to you. Anyhow, we're going to move on and paint his skin. And for this, I'm using Vallejo Brown Rose. Now, if you've never seen me use this before, uh, this is... Ooh, this is pink. This is so pink. And I will be 100% honest, until very near when we're finished, this is going to look dreadful. But as always, I need you to keep the faith. And if you do decide to paint these guys this way, then you'll need to hold your nerve as well. This will definitely take two coats. And as always, wait for the first one to dry thoroughly before applying the second. 
Now, one thing I do want to touch on real quickly while I'm painting these, one nice thing on the kit that I do genuinely really like is the faces. I know I grizzled about how they were put on the uh, sprue, but they've actually got so much detail on them. They're really going to be satisfying to paint. Now that is pink. That is so pink. I've painted skin this way a few times now, and it does work, I promise. But if you get a little nervous now, I totally understand. Of course, there's no right way to paint skin. So if you want to do it however you've already done and you enjoy, just stick to what you're doing and what is working for you. We're going to move on now and paint this pack here. And for this, I'm using German Camo Orange Ochre, which is quite a name. And I'm actually going to use one of the Citadel Medium Base Brushes, because I do quite like the slightly flatter uh, bristles that it has. It's really useful for this. Now you'll see straight away that this doesn't cover perfectly. It is quite a light color. And two coats later, I'm sure we're going to be fine. Now we're painting this now because this has got some leather straps on it that we're going to want to paint, well, leather later. And if we paint this now, it saves time on us coming backwards and forwards to do different stages. So let's get this bad boy oranged up. Now, speaking of that leather, it was actually quite a nice, uh, very rich, warm, almost red leather. So for this, I'm using mahogany brown. Now we're doing the leather now because of the way that the rest of his equipment is layered over the top, particularly on his front. Uh, but these three straps, I am going to move to a smaller brush to do, but these three straps and the outer ring lip thingy on this pack, they would also have been leather. Uh, use a smaller brush. If you're not feeling up to it, just leave it in the brown that it is. But otherwise, let's fill in this leather now. Now there's the straps on that pack, and as well, any other leather details. The beautiful thing about Mahogany Brown is that it covers extremely well, so you'll be able to do all of that in one coat. And we're going to move on to other elements of his equipment, and for this I'm actually switching to a Vallejo Game Color. Color. <laughs> we're going to use Khaki. Now the difference between the Game Color and the Model Color Khaki is that this Game Color one is a little lighter and not quite, it's not got a green touch to it like the normal khaki does. But it's going to make a wonderful base coat for this knapsack and his water bottle. So I'm going to paint these in. And same as before, I'm going to use just an ordinary layer brush or regiment brush or whatever to do the big areas. And then I will swap on down to a smaller brush to paint the straps across his chest. Now the same as with Mahogany Brown, the thing I really like about Game Color Khaki is it actually covers super well. You will probably want to do a second coat across the larger areas like the knapsack, but on his chest straps, that's just one coat. Really nice for a color where you don't want to be spending a lot of time <laughs> trying to avoid making mistakes. What I have now is some flat brown, and we're going to paint in his boots with this. Now, as well as his boots, I've also painted in his hair with that flat brown. There's not really a right color to do this, just pick whatever you like. The only suggestion I would have is that do it before you paint the helmet, because then you don't have to worry about painting over the helmet. Now, at this point, because we've done all of the soft equipment, if you were going to speed paint this guy, what I would do now would be to just give him a quick all over dry brush of dark sand. Not very heavy, and if you want some suggestions, I've got a speed painting video on British infantry, where all of the same lessons are basically going to apply here. But I do want to take this fella a little further and sort of highlight normally. So I'm going to carry on though, and I'm going to use beige brown to paint in his rifle. Now, when it comes to any details that are going to be black, just paint straight over the top of them. It will not matter. Now, while that dries, we're going to move on and paint his helmet and a couple of other little details. For this, I'm using brown violet. Now, Brown Violet is the old paint name. You'll find this is still appearing on some bottles in stores. You might also find it as US Olive Drab. Luckily, this covers beautifully. Um, I've seen some folks use a much more vibrant green for the helmets. Um, I tend to see the French ones as being a little less uh, saturated with their green. And while this doesn't look very dark going on, once it's shaded, it's going to look really cool. Now the other little detail we're going to paint with Olive Drab is his tin cup down here. Um, I've seen this in 
this green. I've also seen it like a pewter, so it's just a little tin mug. Uh, it's really up to you, but I figure since I've got this color out, he's going to have a green mug. <laughs> now the last details we have to paint before we move on to our shade is going to be any black details. And for this, well, I'm going to use black. No great surprise there. So now you can pick up and tidy up the black detailing on your rifle. Um, some folks will prefer using a, well, it's literally called gunmetal is the name of the color. And once it's shaded, that'll go a little more dull. I personally prefer to do this in black and then touch that up later. So we'll blacken all of the bits that are going to be. Uh, and as well, these guys have got the bayonet cases on the backs. These will also be black. All right, I just realized I told a filthy lie. There is one last stage we need to do before we go to our shade. I've got here gunmetal. This is a model air color. And we are going to use this later to highlight our uh, gunmetal, funnily enough. But for now, just a little dribble of this on any coat buttons. When we shade it, this is going to bring this down quite a bit. And once you've decided what color you're going to do your buttons, any last minute cleanup, particularly of the buttons, I found I needed to go back with a little green brown, but just tidy up any last blodges and such like that, and you're ready to go. So let's put this fella aside, and I have here my little mixed up bottle of strong tone and quick shade mixing medium. Now a common question is, do I mean the war paint mixing medium or the quick shade mixing medium? Well, <laughs> we're using quick shade. This is from the army painter, so I'm using the quick shade mixing medium. What I would suggest is don't bother using this on a wet palette. It will end up thinning this out a little more than you might like while you're using it. So let's go ahead and just pour out a wee bit of this into a little cheap plastic palette. This cost me like a euro from the stationery aisle at my local supermarket. And then we apply to our miniature. So let's start jamming this all over the figure. And as always, we want to really make sure that we are working this into the recesses particularly up around his face. If you find it cludges up, and gives you a really blodgy finish. While it's still wet, move it around. So if I make a big mistake here, let's just bit far too much on his jacket. While it's wet, move it around. Shift it to where it wants to go. Now the quick shade, once you've put it on, let it settle for a couple of seconds because you'll find that it will move just a bit, which is actually quite handy. Uh, but once you've seen it settle, you can decide whether or not you want to shift it or to leave it where it's going to dry. So no matter what, once you've got this all covered, you want to leave this for about 30 to 40 minutes to dry thoroughly. Now, as always, you'll find that that shade makes a world of difference. And in particular, he doesn't look quite so pink anymore, which is really going to come in handy. Now we'll move on to a couple of highlights. And I mentioned this was going to be mostly Vallejo. What we're going to use here, this is Talon Sand from Citadel. And weirdly, it is a perfect highlight color for French uniform once it's been shaded. So let's just get that into shot. And it's really up to you how much of this you use. It's not going to be a very sharp highlight once it dries, but it'll be plenty to just sketch out some of the high points of the model. Don't worry too much about that little satin sheen you've got left over from the... Uh, the varnish, not the varnish, goodness me, the shade. But as much or as little of this as you like to accentuate some of the folds. Yeah, go nuts. Tell on sand. It's absolutely magic. Now that won't take you long to do. And once it's finished, it looks pretty good. I would suggest don't do what I just did and over highlight that sleeve. Uh, there's quite a lot of little ridges and details on there. I'm just going to pop a wee bit of shade on there to get rid of that, I think. I'm going to go back to our German camo orange, German, German camo orange ochre. There we go. And I am going to brighten up the pack a little. So across the top here, just a wee bit of this. I'll turn to another Citadel color for this, which is conveniently just perfect for what we're doing. This is Ungor Flesh, and we're not going to highlight very, you know what? I am probably going to end up highlighting more than I want with this. It is the way of these things. It will look very bright going on, but same as with most acrylics. As it dries, it's going to look a lot more reasonable. So take your time with this one, but it will look dead smart once you've finished. 
Now that's going to be a little bit of extra work, but because it is quite a prominent part of the miniature, I suggest it's probably going to be worth it. We're going to move on now to some beige red, and finally we're going to make our dude look a little more human. So we're going to paint over most of the skin with beige red and leave just that pink in the recesses. So the backs of his hands are a really good place to start with this. You can get a feel for how this is going to flow off your brush. And then we'll start highlighting his face. And like I said earlier, these guys have got so much happening here, they're actually really fun to do. Now suddenly he's not pink. We're going to move on and we're going to do a final highlight. I have here basic skin tone from Vallejo. And as I've mentioned before, if you see somebody who is this color, get them help. But for a highlight, this is really handy. So I'm going to do just a tiny wee bit on places like the tip of his nose, his cheekbones, and such forth. So a little bit of this. Now, however you decide to do the face, once you're satisfied with that, I'm going to flip him around, and we're going to highlight with medium gray some of these beige areas. Because medium gray, in true Vallejo style, is not gray. It's, it's a very light beige. So just a few areas of this. Same as with everything else. We'll just do some quick highlights, sharpen that up a little bit. Now we're entering very much the realms of if you want to at this point. I am fussing about and having fun. So I've got here a little bit of red leather, and we're going to highlight the red leather. <laughs> Uh, I do suggest be fairly sparing with this though, because you'll find it is very easy to suddenly overpower that brown and make it look just orange by comparison. So this spot here on the back of his pack is a good spot for this, just a wee tiny bit towards the corners any second now. There we go. Just enough to highlight there. Now I'd say in some areas like hiding behind his his arms there, don't worry about highlighting. We've got now back to our gunmetal, and we're going to highlight just a little bit of the gunmetal. <laughs> it's kind of obvious in some of these situations. Again, I'd say don't go crazy with this, just a little bit to touch off the very edges and high points of these areas of detail. And now the last detail that I am going to highlight is going to be the metal parts. Of his helmet and his little tin cup. For this I'm using green grey. Now there are two Vallejo green greys. One of them is this one we're using and the other one is almost white, so I'm sure you'll be able to spot the difference. <laughs> Just a tiny wee bit of this and you can use the edge of your brush to get a nice sharp line on the helmet there. Now that's all of the painting done. What I'm going to do now is actually to hit him with a matte varnish, and I'll show you what that looks like before going ahead and basing it, because that little bit of sheen from the shade, I think it makes it difficult to see essentially the finished product. So let's take a step forward, varnish him. Now I think the difference between the shaded and then the varnished version is pretty marked. So if you don't know that's what you're going to come into, it can be kind of daunting holding your nerve, but I really like how that turns out, eh? So let's go ahead and base him and have a look at our finished French infantryman. And there at last, our War Games Atlantic plastic French infantryman is complete. And to be honest, once he's all finished, I kind of like the look. The kit itself is still, I mean, there are still those little things which bug me, but they paint up well. And to be quite honest, I'm pretty happy with that result. If you had a whole army on the table looking like that, I think you'd be pretty happy. And one of the other cool things about the kit is the fact that it comes with so many spare arms, and if you happen to have some of the French Resistance kits, uh, you'll know that they are a little bit light when it comes to rifles. So a whole bunch of spare rifles, it's a good excuse to pick up both of those kits at the same time, because as well during the late war period, you would end up with some of the French forces of the interior wearing these early, early uniforms, as late as early 1945, because as they captured German stores, which had been originally captured French stores, they were able to outfit their guys with some uniforms. So thank you very much to Exit 23 Games for the light and sound equipment, as well as all of the patrons who are keeping me ticking in paints and glue, including my producers, Alan Nuttall, Kyrie Crawford, Trainboy, Fred, and Jimmy. Your support really makes a difference. It allows me to pick up these boxes and have some fun with them. Any questions or anything, feel free to drop them in the old comments box below. 
My Twitter and Instagram are both linked there too. So thank you very much for your time one and all, and you all enjoy the rest of your day.